So remember, the starting point of a scalar conservation law, uh, discretizing a scalar conservation law, is the what form? Is the integral form, because this is the only form that makes sense. The only form that doesn't involve d dx of any discontinuous functions. Right? I mean, if, if you remember, when we do finite difference, we are using Taylor series to analyze the accuracy of our discretization. And in the Taylor series, we no matter how high order the scheme is, we have a remaining term that is proportional to delta x to the whatever power <coughs> times the certain derivative of this function. Right? For example, a second order scheme, the the error term would be proportional to delta x square times maybe the third order derivative of the function, maybe the fourth order derivative of the function, depending on what is the differential operator. But the thing is, when you have a discontinuous solution, the third order derivative is what? It's infinite, okay? It's infinite. The fourth order derivative is infinite. So the order of accuracy doesn't, Taylor series, order of accuracy doesn't make any sense anymore. So no matter what you do, you get potentially infinite amount of error. So use the integral form. Use the integral form to avoid the potential problems with finite difference. f of u at b minus f of u at a equal to 0. Okay. And let us divide the whole equation by b minus a. So if you divide this, the integral of the solution over a small range by b over a, we get the average, the average value of u inside b and a. So d dt of u bar, okay, over b and a plus f over the left, uh, uh, on the right side of the domain, let's say right, minus f left equal to zero. Apply, oh sorry, uh, over b minus a. So apply this in a domain discretized in small intervals. Delta x, 2 delta x, 3 delta x. And this is n delta x. How many how many of these averages do we have? So be very careful about the distinction between finite volume and finite difference. In finite difference, we depend on boundary conditions. We may have n minus one unknowns. We may have n plus one unknowns. We may have n unknowns if the two sides has different boundary conditions. For finite volume, we always have n unknowns, the number of intervals. All right. So let me write this as u bar 1, so the first cell average, u bar 2, etc. u bar, this would be n. What I have is d u bar i dt plus b minus a would be delta x, right? And this is the flux at the right side of the interval i which I call i plus half, because it's right in between the interval i and i plus 1. The, now we use integers. We, we use integers to denote the cells. And the grid points now becomes like second class citizens. So we use the half fractional numbers to denote them. Like in finite difference, the, the grid points are first class citizens. We use integers to denote them. In finite volume, that's not the case. We reserve the integers to denote the cells and the boundaries, they are less important. We use fractional indices. Minus f of i minus half equal to zero. All right. So this is our finite volume scheme and this is exact. So there is no approximation yet in this derivation. Now let's start our approximation. 
the approximation needs to be there because the f is evaluated at the grid points so so this f i plus one for example is equal to f of u at x i plus half right x i plus half is uh, the grid points and we don't have them in finite volume we only keep we only remember the cell averages so we have to do some kind of uh, interpolation so this is what we have to interpolate so there are two types of interpolations one type is to interpolate the u the solution and apply the flux on top of the interpolated solution the other way is to compute the flux directly on the cell averages and then interpolate the flux so either way is a perfectly fine finite volume approximation for example i'm just going to give a very elementary example that is we call the central flux scheme 